Welcome to the Native Pollinator Habitat Road Trip number two. Native plants are all the rage right now, or all the buzz, considering how much pollinators love native flowers. Our youth have been planting natives with pride in our Clear Lake communities. Plant diversity is essential to pollinators, to thriving ecosystems for healthy wildlife, we also celebrate and take pride in the diversity in our human communities. Learning about native plants with youth has been interesting and exciting. With so much fragmentation and habitat loss in the Houston region, we are fortunate to highlight these partnerships. Those who appreciate nature realize that someone had to take action and take measures to conserve what was being lost or put at risk. The simple truth is we can't live without our pollinators. Pollination is an essential ecological process. Without pollinators, humans and wildlife wouldn't have much to eat or look at. The Youth Pollinator Habitat Program has provided support to local schools, scouts, and their partners across the Clear Lake region to engage youth families and communities in establishing pollinator habitat projects with grant funding from our generous partners. The program's objectives are to increase awareness about declining pollinator populations, educate youth on the importance of using native plants to establish quality pollinator habitats in the Clear Lake area. The program will provide native plants, seeds, signage, milkweed, and support for schools, scouts, and local community partners to create habitat projects that involve youth. Project benefits include quality pollinator foraging and nesting habitat, but also opportunities for youth to get outside and gain appreciation for wildlife and conservation. What is the need for the program? Pollinating insects are an essential component in global food production. Approximately one third of all food and beverage products need pollination, yet many species of native pollinator and domestic honeybees are in decline. Monarch butterfly populations have decreased 90% in the last two decades and commercial honeybee keepers are reporting losses up to 30% annually. While there is a debate on the reasons for declining pollinator populations, most scientists agree the lack of quality foraging and nesting habitat is a major factor. Pollinator habitat that provides a diverse mixture of native flowering plants of different color, shapes, and size is what is needed to support the life cycle needs of many pollinator species. Today's youth spend the majority of their time fixated on electronic devices and less than half of the time outdoors that their parents did. Research shows that children who spend more time outdoors are healthier, receive better grades, have longer attention spans, and are less prone to depression than children who spend most of their time indoors. If this trend continues, Children today will not develop the affinity to the outdoors they need both physically and emotionally. Stress levels are high for children and educators, but there is respite in the native habitat garden. In the garden, kids learn and grow in ways they do not indoors. Kids bring a sense of genuine wonder to the garden and they never lack enthusiasm when planting native plants is the hands-on task. Our first stop is Ward Elementary, the Kindness Grows Garden by Stephanie Popper, who is the counselor, and Elizabeth Pawlowski, principal.
they created a pollinator garden that will beautify the campus and one that students can spend time reading kindness quotes on stepping stones or wooden stakes in the garden. They wanted to provide cross-curricular, hands-on learning for all grade levels. Our second stop is with the St. Thomas the Apostle Episcopal School in Nassau Bay by Ali Hardick, Administrative Assistant, and Kim Better, fifth grade teacher. This native pollinator habitat was one of our Native Pollinator Habitat Grant Program awardees. The school had a work day in early spring where students planted native seeds, cleared weeds, sticks, and added soil, and can report now that all is in bloom and pollinators of all sorts are present. Our next stop is a butterfly garden at McNair Park. This project was a huge success. The City of El Lago Parks Board had watched this butterfly garden deteriorate and the Girl Scout leaders and the Girl Scouts wanted to improve the site. So on April 30th, we gathered up the plants from a lot of donations from the Native Plant Society of Texas Clear Lake. And the children and the parents met at the site early on a Saturday morning and installed over 75 plants. It is beautiful, it is blooming, and the children have a lot to say about what they learned. Hopefully, you will enjoy these first graders as much as I have. Butterfly egg, caterpillar chrysalis. Butterfly egg, caterpillar chrysalis. Butterfly up in the sky. This is the life cycle of a butterfly. Changes, changes around it. It's called metamorphosis. The next stop will be at the Ed White Bee Garden by Christina Reynolds, PTA board parent and Matt Paulson principal. Well-established certified habitat since 1985 with two wetland ponds, watershed mural, outdoor classroom, listening benches, etc. Eagle Scout Tyler Lucas plans to enhance the trails, repair the wooden bridge, and plant more natives at the site. And he did this over spring break 2022. Barrier Trees donated six yards of tree mulch and 300 feet of border logs. Recently, fifth graders planted sunflower seeds to honor the brave people of Ukraine. A garden tour was scheduled April 14th 2020 for the Deegan Design Garden Club, which was successful. What did 
you just see out here in the schoolyard habitat? I saw a jumping spider and some squirrels of like different kinds of animals. First graders worked with Robin and I and other parent volunteers to plant 40 native plants from the Native Plant Society. The first graders had a wonderful time and saw our resident ribbon snake, which was a big hit. The Native Plant Society of Texas coloring book with beautiful art from Mary Horn was distributed at many of our pollinator habitat school sites. At the Ed White Elementary School, the children all had a wonderful time submitting their colorful coloring book pages and received a package of seeds to plant at their own homes. Asking schools to maintain and sustain the sites with water, habitat maintenance workdays, and pollinator education has been challenging. We would love to have more Native Plant Society members consider partnering with area schools. The next part of our road trip is to go to the Lepidoptera Landing at LaPorte High School. They have a fabulous team of three dedicated educators, Shelby Jones, biology teacher, Charles Jobson, scientific research and design and roots up course. Ms. Johnson used to teach chemistry and provides instructional technology support. I had the pleasure of visiting their site in May and was so impressed with what they are doing and how they are working as a team with the students at the high school. Welcome. I'm Awen Johnson. I'm the one that works in instructional technology. And I also have Shelby Jones here. She's going to be chiming in as I share our presentation. So we started Lepidoptera Landing. There the three of us are with three of our raised beds that are part of Lepidoptera Landing. And I will say right now, one of the things that we learned is this is definitely not a one person endeavor. We've been successful because we have two teachers who are in the classroom working with students, and I am no longer in the classroom, but I have the time to do all of the paperwork and all of the ordering for all of the supplies and stuff that we needed to be successful. So this is what we started out with about five years ago. The high school did a remodel and we have this huge courtyard space that was basically not being used. Students would walk through, you know, to go to class during passing periods, but it was basically just a lot of open space. So our original plan, we went and we wanted to create the pollinator garden right here in this section of the courtyard. And we ended up, it's right over here in the corner, we actually ended up working on this side. And Ms. Jones and Mr. Jobson and I for several years would always talk about, we need to do something with that space. We need to start a pollinator garden. And we talked to people in the school district and it just never moved forward. And then I guess in August, I saw the notice for in the Citizens Environmental Coalition that the Clear Lake chapter had a grant program and we could get money for seeds and plants. So I went to Mr. Jobson and I went to Ms. Jones and I asked them if they wanted to be my kind of advisors and help me get this off the ground. And they both said if they didn't have to do any of the writing or any of the paperwork, they were all in. So I promised I would do that part as long as they provided all the physical labor because they had all the students. And so we applied for the grant. And then uh, when we received the grant, we figured out that we were going to need a lot more supplies. So mm -hmm. I applied for a second grant with the Laporte Education Foundation, and we were able to get the supplies for the raised beds. We also, the picture you see right now, this was all of the soil that was donated by the district 
we ended up creating six raised beds. So this wasn't enough to fill all six, but I, I think it filled about four of them. And then with our Education Foundation grant money, we were able to buy the rest of the soil. And I'm gonna go through these pictures so you can kind of see the process. So this is when we were first getting the framework together. And I would say this was probably, Shelby, this was in March, wouldn't you say? Yes, mid-March, late March. So we applied for the grant, the original grant we applied in September. We didn't get our Education Foundation grant until November. And then when we came back from Christmas break, we were able to start ordering all the materials. I learned a lot about the ordering process in a school district. It took me about six weeks to actually get this first order in so that we were able to start construction on the raised beds. I got much better at ordering for our next two orders, but we didn't actually start anything until probably maybe right after spring break. So it might have been mid-March that we were actually starting this. So these were the, Mr. Jobson was out with his students and Mr. Jobson was cutting the, the wood and the, the kiddos were, were drilling and putting everything together. And then this is um, once they had those first three beds created, they started filling them with the soil. Eventually we got in um, the rest of our materials. We finished, again, we ended up with six beds. And I think that's when we headed to the spring plant sale. And I'm gonna just let Ms. Jones take over because she had the students and a lot of these kids had never done any sort of gardening whatsoever. So she'll talk about her experience with these kiddos and I'll flip through these pictures. So the pictures that you're seeing on the screen right now is actually my attempt at bribing freshmen with extra credit at first. That's at first how we get the kids involved, right? And so most of the kids that you're seeing in this shot had no idea what they were doing. They probably never touched a plant before, honestly. They handled them like they were delicate little pieces of crystal or something. And so some of the upperclassmen that I had, you know, talked plants with before we all kind of gathered around and were like, it's okay. It was almost like a baptism of sorts. And so these kids eventually. The second or third time we would go out there, I would mention, okay, if you already got extra credit for six weeks, you can't get any more, but we are going to go to the garden again today after school. And so a lot of those kids would show up time and time again because they got the fever. A seed was planted, if you will. And they really enjoyed the process. And so we would go out there as a class sometimes we'd water in the mornings. And the kids who, like, this is my plant, this is the plant that I planted, the kids who would say, Miss Jones, you forgot to water my plant. And so it, they became very attached to it. A lot of the freshmen. And then so for the upper class, I look at that delicate child right there, just like delicately placing it in. They did a really great job. As far as where we put the plants, obviously, while we were talking about where to put the plants, we talked about the pollinators and why we were doing this. As we flip through these pictures, you guys will see there's not a lot of logic as to where we put what within the beds. I basically said to the kids, you know what? If there's an open spot in the first three, we'll go ahead and fill that up. It's going to look very au naturel. It's going to look great. And I think I just watered them this morning. We have some really updated pics coming up here in just a second. I think the kids actually did a really good job. It looks like what you might see in when you're walking along uh, Arm and Bayou Nature Center. It's There's clusters of similar species and plants and then there's the I think it's the frog one that creeps around on the ground it's got like depths and layers to it so even though the students and I didn't really have very much idea of what it was going to look like at the end I think it ended up looking really really good and even some of the kids who weren't mine in particular ended up becoming participative in the process of just keeping up with it so I was walking and watering during my conference period one day and a student who was skipping class I presume I don't know I'm assuming, was skipping from um, the art room down to the, the library or the STEM building. And he was passing by and he saw me watering. He said, Miss, what are you doing? I said, I'm watering these plants. Son, what are you doing? Where should you be? And he's like, I'm supposed to be at art. I was going to go to the library and skip, but do you want help? And I'm like, sure. Come on, grab a plan. And then we, we watered the garden and then I sent him back to class and it was fun. It was a good gig. 
there's a lot of excitement from the adults at the high school. I get stopped all the time. People asking me, what did you plant? Where did you get the plants? Our art teacher is super thrilled because it's right outside of her classroom. So she's going to take the kiddos out there so that they can do drawings and be inspired by what's growing in the gardens. I have taken tours from the technology department so that they could go see. I think they get on the cameras every single day so that they can watch what's growing. So there's a lot of excitement, both with the students and with the adults at LaPorte. I saw a question in the chat earlier that popped up as how are they being taken care of in the summer? So that was something that we were worried about. Mr. Jobson actually has a lot of animals that he takes care of, I guess like a living materials center. And he hires students every summer to take care of the animals at the high school. So uh, we just added a new responsibility. So these girls have just graduated and they are coming in and they're taking care of the animals, but they're also taking care of the gardens. I get on the cameras every morning and I double check to make sure that they've shown up and that they're taking care and making sure that they're watering. So these pictures were taken about, I would say about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. It's probably just two weeks ago when they were first starting at the beginning of the summer. And Shelby went to the high school today, and this is where we are currently. So this is an update, pictures taken today. And that's our presentation. Thank you. I did want to address one question about how we treated the soil under the raised bed. So the raised beds in and of themselves were just the pre-treated wood, and then there's the soils that we got, I think some of them were donated, some of them we purchased with some funding from the grants. It was essentially just topsoil. In a perfect world, we would have definitely had some sort of like a gravel layer. We would have had some plastic coating on the bottom to keep any of the other types of weeds from getting in. We didn't want to spend all of our money doing that. So as a result, we ended up mixing in some free mulch from the city of Laporte, which Mr. Jobson procured. And we put that obviously at the top layer and then it's just top soil fundamentally. And we also added some, I forget what the product was, but it was like a long release fertilizer that you just like sprinkle on top. I would have a quick question personally, Nancy saying, who designed those beds? I just think that's beautiful. That was in large part to Miss Johnson and I looking at the student designs because Mr. Jobson and I both had several class periods because we teach AP Bio and I, I teach AP Bio, he teaches AP Environmental Science. We had all of our students design their own, like in an ideal world, what would your gardens look like? And so Miss Johnson and I were taking a look at some of the suggestions from the students one day and we were both like, these are, these are fine, but like, what could we do? And then we saw one of them etch out into a T. And then Ms. Johnson said, what if we just, and then we just have all the way, and it, geometrically, it fits so perfectly in the section. I just, that was 90% her brilliance and 10% my student effort. <laughs> I think I was walking by and I saw them laying out the timbers and I was concerned because it didn't look like what we had originally agreed upon. And so I was afraid we wouldn't have enough. And I knew we didn't have a whole lot of money to buy more. So I stopped by and it and they were kind of like making it looked like they were trying to spell something out. And I wasn't confident in what they were spelling out. But I said, hey, I like the tea. What if we did some inverted teas? And, and so we did that out and it worked out. We were trying to avoid a conspiracy that we were trying to spell something. So I think the teas in this matched like a Tetris vibe, right? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Our last stop on this pollinator road trip is the UHCL Pocket Prairie at the University of Houston Clear Lake. And Jeffrey Fado will tell us about this project that aims to restore coastal prairie to the campus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Fado. I am a graduate student here at the University of Houston Clear Lake. And I'm going to present my final report for the Native Pollinator Habitat Grant that my group received as of last year. I'm currently pursuing a double master's in environmental science and environmental management. So why did I apply for the Native Plant Society of Texas Clear Lake Native Pollinator Habitat Grant? 
Well, at the end of the spring semester 2021, I co-founded a new student organization on the UHCL campus known as the Environmental Justice Association. And we created, me and my group of officers created this organization so that we could spread environmentalism, activism, with the goals of educating the student body about environmental issues in the greater Houston area to preserve or conserve the native habitat that we still have and to protect and grow the native habitats that have been damaged. During the summer of 2021, the EJA, the Environmental Justice Association, my members went and volunteered all over the greater Houston area. We worked with Buffalo Bayou. We worked with Armin Bayou Nature Center. We've worked with the Galveston Bay Foundation. And we were trying to educate ourselves as to what was the most pressing local environmentalism issue that we wanted to prioritize as our first student project. And after working heavily at Armin Bayou Nature Center and seeing their beautiful prairies out there and coming to work at the Environmental Institute of Houston's Habitat work days on Tuesdays, we decided that we wanted to bring native plants back to the UHCL campus. During this time, we wanted to prepare ourselves. So we began to interview uh, several professionals that are in the field. We spoke with Jaime Gonzalez, who is the Houston Urban Conservation Program Manager of the Nature Conservancy. We used his Nine Natives Guide, which some of you have probably heard of, as a way of, to bring native plants to urban settings. We spoke with Gabriel Durham, the U of H Sustainability Coordinator, and we spoke heavily and have worked heavily with both Wendy Reisel and Rowena McDermott who are environmental educators here at the Environmental Institute of Houston. So after all of this research, trying to find out where best we could send a large swath of students who are interested in preserving our environment, we decided that we wanted to create a pocket prairie pollinator garden on campus. And we wanted to work in conjunction with the Environmental Institute of Houston, which is on the UHCL campus, as well as the newest institute, the Institute for Human and Planetary Sustainability. And you can see their logos there on the left. This was the initial Pocket Prairie location. We found a very central location on campus that was very high traffic for both students and for faculty. This was an area that was located between the STEM building or the rec center, the Hunter's Hall dormitory, and the student services and classrooms building, the majority of which are some of the newest buildings that we have on campus with the hope that we would be in a very high traffic area for people to see a lot of these beautiful and diverse native plants and to hopefully appreciate this little bit of beauty that we are bringing to the campus. This initial location though was rejected by the UHCL administration. They thought that this area had potential for events that were on campus. And to be fair, we did initiate this plan during the pandemic. So there was not a lot of on-campus activity. And to be fair, since the pandemic has begun to lessen, this space has been in use several times, so we can understand why this initial plan was rejected. But that being said, this is what the initial proposal was looking at for how we'd like to stratify our plants based on height, shape, whether they were grasses or wildflowers, and based on the type of insect and bird pollinators we wanted to encourage on our campus. And as you can see, we were interested in uh, ensuring that the maintenance of this prairie was easy for our facilities. That way it could be carried on far after I will eventually leave this campus and so that other people could come and run this community garden. We had a walking path, we had grass strips, and as you can see, it's a very high traffic central location. Now, we eventually had to petition for a UHCL pocket prairie because we were getting a significant amount of pushback against wanting to bring native plants to our campus. And some of the main reasons why our initial proposal was rejected by the administration was that the campus facilities were short staffed due to the pandemic. And we can't do anything about that, sadly. The location was too central for our initial or our pilot pocket prairie installation, which is fair. And they claimed that there was a lack of support from the UHCL community. And of these three things, that was what we decided to focus on and to go and petition our community to find out if this is something that not only people were interested in seeing, but if this was something that our community was willing to work together and create. And after petitioning our community for about a month, we got about 140 signatures and 
readdress the issue with administrations and they, we decided to come to a compromise. And instead of taking over this small centralized location on campus, they gave us the UHCL Entrance 2 project and let us convert it into pocket prairies. Now, the UHCL Entrance 2 pocket prairie was much larger than our initial prairie location. It's divided into two plots, which we call Entrance 2 North and Entrance 2 South. And they're divided by Bayou Road and Bay Area Boulevard, where that intersection is. And they measure out to just over an acre, which is more than four times larger than our initial Pocket Prairie project. So this area, as you can see in the pictures, and this is after it had been heavily disturbed. This area was essentially from the sidewalk and the road back into the rest of the bottomland forest. It was dense overgrown thicket covered in invasive privet, invasive Chinese tallow, and significantly overgrown yelpon holly. And they wanted to clear out this entire area and knock down all of the trees in this area so that they could open up the campus to passersby on Barrier Boulevard. We thought that this was wrong, and we decided to take this compromise so that we could keep some of the largest and oldest trees that are on our campus and let them thrive, while at the same time bring a pocket prairie in the form of a savanna creation onto our campus. And this is a little bit of information about where this is on our campus, as here we are, where we are in Texas relative to Houston. Here is a picture of the north side of the campus of the University of Houston Clear Lake. And in this box here, this is entrance two, this is where our location is. As you see, we have a division between these two plots and both are roughly about half an acre. Just as a little bit of context about this area, because I think this is important to note, this is some of the oldest aerial photography of the UHCL campus area many years prior to the development of the campus. This is essentially an area of Clear Lake, circa 1944. And I wanted to highlight a few things as to why this is more a savanna creation, a prairie creation, rather than a restoration. We have Horston Bayou, and this is prior to the bayou being channelized. You can see in the dark gray in these dots, uh, this is bottomland hardwood forest. And as you can see, this blue box up here is the uh, eventual location of where the UHCL entrance to Pocket Prairie will be. And it's less than a thousand feet from the bayou prior to it being channelized. So it's more than likely that this, is this was originally a bottomland forest location, yet it exists at the edge between bottomland forest and prairie, which is why we're seeing this as a savanna creation. Now, how was the native pollinator habitat grant used? Well, from the $500 that we got from this grant, we spent about $20 on acquiring a native pollinator garden sign, and the rest of the money was put towards native seed and shipment. Because the size of our pocket prairie quadrupled, we had to reach out to a variety of people in order to make sure we had enough seed in order to seed this project. We, uh, because of the size of this project, we initially were going to hand plant all of our plants and we then changed to seeding with a seed drill. We needed more seeds in order to fill out an acre of land, and we got help from our administrations, and then we got maintenance help from our facilities as well, and we're now working in conjunction, and it's been smooth sailing so far. Where we purchased our seed from was from the Native American Seeds and from the Douglas King Company Seeds, both of which are reputable native seed distributors here in Texas. Now, we generated our seed mix to contain 84 different native grass and wildflower species. And this had a range of annuals, biennials, and perennials with a, a heavy mix of annuals so that we could get a quick ground coverage to hopefully prevent invasives from returning to the site. Now, where did those seeds come from? Well, we got them from this grant, which is where we purchased the majority of our seeds. We had our UHCL facilities purchase more seeds from Native American Seed and from Douglas King. We collected a lot of seeds with the Environmental Institute of Houston during the 2021 semesters, especially in the fall. 
And we had lots of seeds donated from actually a large amount of you who are attending this presentation from Master Naturalist, from Native Plant Society of Texas members, as well as from EIH. And based on some research that we had done, we decided to seed at double the rate as traditional seeding rates so that we could ensure the establishment of the prairie in this heavily disturbed site. So we ended up seeding with 20 pounds per acre instead of 10 pounds per acre. And you can see the creation of those seeds in that short little video. We also decided to do supplemental plantings, i.e. we took a select amount of seeds from all the seeds that we had purchased through the grant, and we put them into seed trays in order to germinate them. By allowing the germination of these seeds, we could control some of the plants that we would hopefully then supplement into our sites. This allowed us to understand what these plants would look like as they were growing, as well as whether or not they adhered to certain guidelines, whether they were more sun tolerant or shade tolerant, whether they enjoyed more or less water. These were things that we could troubleshoot with just on hand. But once we had germinated these seeds in seed trays, we then moved them into either seed plug trays or moved them into four inch pots or moved them up and up until they got to about gallon pots. And this is a picture of two members of the Environmental Justice Association working together to move, I believe it's Sidoat's Brahma into gallon pots. And we wanted to hand plant or supplement the plant into areas in our entrance to Pocket Prairie where we found bare earth or wherever we would remove invasive species so that we would remove invasives and then put native plants in their place. And a little bit of update on where we are with our pocket prairie so far. We've purchased our native pollinator garden sign. We have all of our seed purchased. We've generated our seed mix. In our seed trays, we've germinated and transferred almost all of the plants except for maybe one or two trays, which will get done this week. All of the ground preparation at the site i.e. the removal of the mulch, the removal of any excess trees to open up the canopy somewhat, the removal of those tree stumps, the removal of a lot of trash and debris has all been completed. The entrance to Pocket Prairie was seeded with a seed drill on March 10th of this year. And so it's been going for a little over three months now, which is good. The maintenance of the Pocket Prairie is currently ongoing. And it's go I'm going to personally monitor it for at least two years as I am currently a graduate student at the university and I'm using my thesis project to study this site. As I'm going to study the effects of prairie creation on native plant diversity, and this is going to be ongoing and I'll present in the fall of 2024. And one more update. During the 2021-2022 UHCL Student Leadership Banquet, my student org, the Environmental Justice Association, was awarded the Community Service Event of the Year for encouraging well over 100 people from the UHCL community to participate in the restoration of prairie habitat at UHCL Entrance to Pocket Prairie, as well as another project of habitat restoration happening on campus where our UHCL Nature Trail is also undergoing prairie restoration. I would also like to acknowledge numerous people as so many people helped us with this project. Special thanks to Wendy Reisel, Megan Topham, Angela Kelling, and Mark Denning for their help with the Pocket Prairie proposal, approval, creation, and maintenance. I would like to say special thanks to Rowena McDermott for advice and assistance while also restoring prairie habitat on the UHCL campus at the same time as this project. A special thanks to the wonderful Master Naturalist and the Native Plant Society of Texas members who attended the Tuesday Habitat Workdays at EAH and shared encouragement, advice, and seeds. Thank you to everyone who donated seeds and their knowledge for the creation of this pocket prairie, especially Jim Duran from Armand Bayou Nature Center, Carter Clay, who is just amazing, and Robin Gates, who is another amazing pocket prairie creator. And a special thanks to everyone from the UHCL community who volunteered their time to bring native plants back to our campus. And here's a, a little video looking at some Rio Grande clammy weed that we have growing out there. Wow. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been able to do this without copious amounts of help and support. So lots of congratulations and thanks all around. Yeah. There's no watering system, is there? There is no watering system. What we have asked is uh, we're working with the UHCL facilities 
and at least once a month, but it seems in the hotter drought that we're experiencing this summer, we asked them to bring out their cistern and do a little bit of watering. But from what we've seen so far, just with initial results, we have a large and diverse amount of plants that have already popped up at entrance two. A lot of Coreopsis, Black-Eyed Susan, Indian blankets and partridge peas have already begun to flower. And uh, it's noticeable that several inland sea oats, several salvia species, and several blue stem species have already begun to make themselves apparent. So it's going well so far. Great. And we always claim native plants don't need excess water, but we kind of think about the baby plants that maybe need a little encouragement in their beginning stages. The way that we approached it to our administrations is during this, the first year to two years while we are encouraging the establishment of this prairie, there does need to be a little bit of babying, a little bit of watching. But so far, the, our main maintenance that we've had to do out there is just pull out copious amounts of Chinese tallow. Oh, yes. The Seabrook Park Mud District 373 is blooming and beautiful. I have gone over there and I am always impressed with how well it's doing. Thanks again to Jim Duran. He was instrumental in working with these young ladies, now high schoolers, they were at Seabrook Intermediate. We also have an update from the Cypress Copperfield Garden. We had photos sent to us from Julie and that native pollinator habitat is also thriving. So we have pollinator pockets. We are making progress, but we need more volunteers. Your volunteer support in seeds, plants, expertise, time, and talents are all welcome. Special thanks to Greg Pearson and Linda for donating three different varieties of local milkweeds to several schools in our Native Pollinator Habitat program. I want to thank all the presenters and all the people that participated in putting the videos together. Uh, again, the, the members of the committee for getting the education grants out there and working with these different grantees to make their projects a success.